Yo, 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 what's good, YouTube? What's good? It's Stormy B, man, and I am back welcoming you to Noise on Culture. This is number four for this Monday, May 23rd, 2022, and we are back with another nerd show for you, and we're calling this one Multiverse of Nerdism. Yes, another play on the words and a play on what's happening, what's going down tonight. We're focusing in a little bit on the comic section of nerdism. You know, we spread it all around from movies to the books, to the graphic novels, you know, newspaper clips. It don't matter. It's all a part of the culture. And we enjoy each and every little bit of it. And we're here to talk about it. I got my man in the building with me. Drew Titan is in the house. What's good, Drew? What's good, Sensei? How are you? Oh, man, I'm excited, man. We're going to get on this Noids on Culture tonight. Let's uh, get it. We've been talking about what we were going to do, and uh, I love the fact that we can bounce back and forth through different means of culture and, 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 and nerdism, you know, so yeah. we don't leave anybody out. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like, cause, hey man, we 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 can do a show talking about toys. You understand? That's <laughs> coming. That's coming. Yeah, exactly. that's coming. And and uh, with so much in culture, that, that there's a lot that we can revisit. So, for people that caught a couple of the episodes that we had so far, and you're like, man, are you gonna talk about this too? And that? just be patient. You know, we got a lot going on. Drew has a lot on his plate. I have a lot on mine, but we ain't forgot about y'all. So when we put these little joints together, just know that we doing it for you. You know what I'm saying? So it's that's what it's all about. You you got anything else on that, Drew? <clears throat> Let me tell you something. Y'all have no idea how big of a nerd I am. There's so much. You got to understand what, what's, what's brilliant about this, this segment is that... um. You get to just kick back and let your feet out. And we're going to take you on a road with movies, you know, uh, all kinds of entertainment. Remember when there was no social media, y'all? Remember when there was no social? Remember when you actually had to go outside and play? All right. Remember when we had to go out? Remember when, when you're sitting in the house just doing nothing and your mama make you, your daddy make you? Yo, boy, go outside. <laughs> take your butt outside. <laughs> go outside. You're just here for nothing. Go outside. That's my ever. All right, they, they, you know, they, they, my our era of growing up was the best era. We had to physically go out there and make friends, not online. You get to see them and size them up. How many weirdos you met and say, okay, I met him, that was cool for that one day, but I'm gonna avoid him moving forward. That's the era we come from. You know, young girls chasing the uh, phone man down the street because they wanted Wyatt to play double dutch. Okay, the the the, the Bell Atlantic guy. You remember the Bell Atlantic phone company? How far back y'all go? Yes, you understand? Sir. He used to give wire to the girl so they could turn double dutch in the street. You understand? And um, a huge part of that was that when it was wintertime outside and it was too much snow on the ground and you had to stay in, we had to occupy our time. With comic books. What was on television. You understand? Sometimes, you know, you went to the movies. That's what the last Noise on Culture was about. You know, black exploitation films. So tonight, we're hitting up in the comic direction, the comic book uh, uh, s segment of this. Man, there's so much to discuss, so much to talk about. Past, present, and future, man. So I'm excited about this. Absolutely. And uh, as we get ready to uh, forge in, and, uh, you know, there's plenty of brothers and sisters out there in the chat right now. If we, if we don't get your name in the roll call, don't feel personal about it because we got some stuff to kick, cook through and we we only got an hour to work with. But starting out, we got skills from New Orleans out there. Geo James, Khalil is out there. Big homie Coop in the building. Uh, KG84 rolling with us this evening. Jason is in the building. And uh, <laughs> T. Berry's out there. T. Berry says, this is a great show because the topics are so dope. I'm still kind of stuck in my childhood. That's hey, man. what's up, man. That's what's up. See, that's what this show is about, man. It's supposed to be something fun for you, huh? And make you feel a little certain kind of way or, or 
nostalgia or whatever. Mac of this Mac is in the building and uh, everybody is saluting each other, man. Salute to everybody out there. We wanted to uh, kick the show off with a little bit of an acknowledgement and a dedication because we had we this month earlier this month, really kicking off the month from May 1st all the way in, into uh, May 7th. We lost two of the legendary comic book artists. And let me tell you, people, I can't say enough because I don't even know the volume of work that these men did. But I can acknowledge what I I noticed. May 1st, it was reported that we lost Neil Adams, the comic book artist for many DC and Marvel projects, most famously known uh, Neil Adams was most famously known for his Batman artwork. People really enjoyed his his Batman uh, work. And uh, I got a chance to meet Neil Adams. uh, I want to say, ooh, this might have been 2017. I know it was just before the pandemic at the the, uh, Comic-Con here in Des Plaines, Illinois, when they come here in August, the month of August, I usually hit them up and I got a chance to meet Neil Adams. Had I known, cause sometimes they announce who's going to be there. And I wasn't looking for the comic book artist, but as I was walking through, you know, everything ran across his table where he was. And I got a chance to say, wow, this is Neil Adams. And if I'd known he was there, what I would have done was I would have brought something with me for him to autograph. Mm -hmm. Now, Neil was famously known, and I'll put his photo up so people can see who he was. Uh, He was famously known for drawing the uh, world famous comic, Superman versus Muhammad Ali. Right. And it was the giant book. And what a lot of people may not know going back to that. And I think that I I'm not nailed down to this, but that book came out in 76, I think, or 77, because it was around Star Wars and stuff like that, because when he did the comic book art for that, the whole cover would fold out from the front to back page. Mm -hmm. with Ali and Superman in the ring, but watching the fight in the audience were a lot of celebrities Mm -hmm. and aliens from the comics and everything. Right. And on the inside of the book were circles around the figures of everyone sitting in the audience with numbers and had their names, who they were. So that was such a cool thing to see um i still have my version of that book it has been in reprint but had i known i would have met neil adams that day i would have brought that book with me and had him autograph it because i had a small conversation with him and he was telling me oh man when you come to these things you got to bring that kind of stuff he's like "We, we, (laughs) we live for that we we live to sign your stuff and i was like man so he had a lithograph print that he had done of Bruce Lee. So I was like, I'll buy that and have him sign that. So that's what I was able to do that day, you know, and salute to Neil Adams, man, hats off to the joy you have given us throughout your years. He was 80 years old when he passed away people, but his artwork will stand the test of time. Matter of fact, his figures that he drew looked so lifelike and model-like. It's like when they started casting for films, Christopher Reeve was believed to step right off the pages of Neil Adams when he was cast as Superman because he looked just like the way Neil Adams would draw him. And so those are the kind of things. And these men with their tremendous talents, they, they created that avenue for us and then when later, m- many years later, when films began began to be popular with these iconic 
comic book characters and everything, it's like it was due to the artwork and the stories that were That's told right. by by people such as he. And uh, just, you know, R.I.P. to a wonderful artist, man. And you can Google him, people. If you're into this, Google him and look up some of his artwork. It is absolutely amazing. Amazing. It's amazing, and, man. Uh, seven days later, after after he passed away, we lost uh, George Perez. George Perez had been battling cancer. Mm. And it turned out that this gentleman, uh, for everything that he dealt with, um, it's it's a track uh, that the, the the c word man it takes so many people away from us you know yeah. but the talent what he was able to do the way he was able to entertain it was just something that i can't i can't speak enough about it but mr perez one of the wonderful things he did he drew both he and neil drew for marvel and dc Yep. So you can see their work out there on both sides of the, you know, fields. And some people are DC strictly. Some people are Marvel strictly. Some people like myself like both because I like to have a little bit of differences, you know, between the themes and the, 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 uh, the way these movies, uh, excuse me, the way that these books and stories are written. Marvel is a little bit lighter. DC was a little bit more, drama driven and he had a tremendous run george perez doing wonder woman but check this out people he penciled the graphic the infinity gauntlet in uh. that which the infinity war and uh end game films were based on so if you could find that book like i was able to do before the films came out a few years back prior to the pandemic that same, that same uh, Wizard World Comic Con that I attended, I sought out books because of what Marvel had coming down the pipeline. And the three books that I was able to get were Captain America, The Winter Soldier, uh -huh. um, uh, Infinity Gauntlet, and then there was one more book that I that I got. Um, and and the three books were all helping me to get prepared for the films that Marvel was going to be sh releasing in the theaters. And I'm so glad that I did it because with Mr. Perez's artwork here, there's just a, a, a one of the pages out of the infinity gauntlet where Thanos using the infinity gauntlet created a, a space. He had a, a, a it was like a, a space rock where he created a, a um, some kind of a monument to himself. And you himself, see the word yeah. God there. And the guy you see standing next to Thanos there is Mephisto. Mephisto. Yep. Now, Mephisto was supposed to be in those films, but there were too many characters, so they decided not to bring him in. But that doesn't mean we will not see him because now that Marvel has started d diving into the uh, mystic arts and things of that nature, the horror side of things, Mephisto hangs around because he is like a god of demons and, and devils. Mm -hmm. So here he was acting as a jester for Thanos and Thanos is admiring one of the monuments that he had made for himself. But this is all penciled by George Perez and I'm telling you, a tremendous graphic novel. If you haven't had a chance to read the Infinity Gauntlet, you guys should check it out because the Infinity Gauntlet, surprisingly, lots of elements from the book were made it into the film. And Drew and, and audience, I just want to say this before we move further, and then I'll let Drew speak his piece on these two gentlemen as well. Um, did you realize, like, from the graphic, Doctor Strange created a means of sending the Avengers in space where they could breathe in space so they could face Thanos. 
because he has snapped half the universe out of existence and everything. So they had to go out there and try to defeat him. And he had all the infinity stones. He had turned Nebula into a zombie, mm -hmm. you know, and when, when, when Dr. Strange did that, they were fighting Thanos on his rock monument there in space. And I had wondered when infinity war, uh, in, when Endgame was going to come, which was part two, I was wondering, like, were they going to meet him in space or something? And of course, they did not, because that's a little far stretched, right, to, for Dr. Strange to create a means for them like that. But not really, because they fought on his home planet. Right. Iron which Man is close enough. His, right. That was close enough. Yeah. But if you watch the film, when Thanos came through that time uh machine because it was the 2012 thanos coming into modern day right? right when he came through he used his ships missiles and bombs to blow up the avengers facility and everything so everything was completely leveled and bedrock and everything and guess what it looked like it looked like they were in space right they were in space because it was all dark smoky dreary all of that, just like it was in the comics. So they still found a way, Drew, to not just repeat the comics, but give it a different look, but still channeling what was originally written and drawn on the pages. I love that kind of attention to detail. And hats off to Kevin Feige for doing that, because he's really the man that's behind all of this stuff. So when he tells his people, don't do this, I don't want that, he has reasons for that. He's not being a control freak. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if you watch Endgame, that film delivered on so many things that people wanted to see. By the time the Infinity Saga wrapped up, we got to see Cap say Avengers Assemble. We got to see Cap lift Milnor. We got to see, you know, Iron Man do. It, it was just incredible what they did with that. But I'll, I'll let you go ahead, Drew, and, and say what you would like to say about Mr. Adams and uh, Mr. Perez, the loss of those two great artists and what they meant to comic books. Well, as you know, um, you know, you and I are artists. You know, um, I've had no training. This is just something that I, you know, got from my dad. I just do it. And um, comic books, cartoons and stuff. They've always been a, a huge part of my youth and they're a huge part of me today. I still watch a select amount of things because it keeps me level. Now, as I got older, you become like these, these artists have a certain cult following and down the road, I want to uh, talk about these other artists, like my favorite artists, but right now let's mm -hmm. focus on um, the, uh, the topic at hand. Um, these two guys, um, he's, these guys are on, I, I saw someone in the chat say, yeah, T. Berry said they're part of the top five. Um, I guess number one, I'm going to say Jack the King Kirby, but these two guys are right there in the top five in that conversation. And y'all know who Jack Kirby is. I'm not even going to, for those of you who are really nerd nerds, you know who Jack the King Kirby, there's a reason why they call him the King. He's a trendsetter. That's why they call him Jack the King. But these two gentlemen, they're, they're right there. They 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 took characters that were pre-made and they put their own twist on it. And um, they developed a cult following, which is why when they showed up at comic book conventions, their booths would be lines out the door to sing. And like when I went to the last comic book convention, again, we don't have enough time in a day to tell you about the artists that I met. I well, I, I geek out over boxers and comic book artists. I geek out because I have so many questions because they they are um, they're doing things that I wouldn't have mind doing at one point in my life, and I respect it. And um, we lost gems in these fellas. We lost gems, and uh, but they're gone, but they will never be forgotten because they have what seems to be an endless line of work that you can always go and uh, uh, look up. And if you really appreciate it, one thing, you can fall in love with a story. Um, you can fall in love with a character. But it takes a certain artist 
to make you relate to that character even more. And if a, if an artist is so good, they can make you like a character that you wasn't even paying attention to. You know what I mean? Sidebar, because I have to give give people an example. If you people in the chat, I know you've heard of an artist named Jim Lee. The way that he draw, I met that man. I geeked out. He's like this tall to me. <laughs> um, and I met that man, and I had so many questions, but. It, I, I saw a signing and I didn't want to wait on a line. I went to the bathroom at the Jacob Javits in New York at the comic convention. And when I was coming out of the bathroom, um, I didn't even know he was in the bathroom. He came out, boom, bumped right into him. I said, oh man, you're Jim Lee. And he looked up, yeah. And we took a picture and everything and it was great. And I just, he, he was real friendly. He answered my questions. I didn't want to hold him up, you know, but we, we talked, we chopped it up for about maybe 10 minutes. He was su such a nice guy. But Jim Lee's art is uh, as such where he could draw, he could just draw, a, a, you wouldn't be interested in the story if you didn't look at the artwork on there. These mm -hmm. fellas that we just lost are directly on those lines. It could be a story or a comic book that you, with characters in it that you really didn't care about. And, um, because of the artwork, you was attracted to the story. You're like, okay, this is great. It's fun to look at. Now what are they talking about? And boom, you become a supporter of their work. And um, like I said, you can Google them. They have a, a, an endless amount of work. And they've also inspired guys like Jim Lee, like Todd McFarlane, like Art Adams, all of those guys. Great artists. And they, they will tell you, yo, look, you know, I grew up watching this guy, watching that guy, you know. So yeah, yeah, that's what I got on that. Yeah, amazing stuff, man, amazing stuff. You know, so, you know, with this evening's show, we thought we would come out and, uh, you know, talk about those two gentlemen since they recently passed earlier this month and just kind of pay homage to what their contributions were. And again, both, the great thing is they, they both work for Marvel and DC. And again, whenever they did what they did, you you could tell their work, you know, mm -hmm. by their pen, by their pencil, you know, yeah, it's like, yeah. you can look at it and be like, Oh, that's, you know, matter of fact, when you mentioned Jim Lee, I would say I've never asked him. You had a conversation with him. Maybe y'all touched on this. Maybe you didn't, but Jim Lee seems to channel Neil Adams the way he draws his characters. They're quite similar, but Adams still, you know, he his is a in its different place. But uh there were other artists who were kind of similar too, like Steve Ditko Steve with Ditko. Uh, uh Marvel. You know, there were just and and as you mentioned, Kirby, he was his own man. Kirby would have really loved Marvel's Eternals film. Yes, he yes, to see yes. that because yes. he created those characters. Mm -hmm. And then when he fell out with Marvel, he went over to DC and created the new gods. Remember that, Drew? Smack in the face. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, wow. But the and it's Eternals... funny. Go ahead. It, I'm Go sorry ahead. not to cut you off, but it's funny because Jim Lee had a similar... All the car all the artists from the 90s, and we could talk about that some other time, but they all branched off and formed image. Yes. But Jim Lee made his mark when he started doing X-Men. That's when he started, you know, he caught fire when he did X-Men, when they revamped it. And there was a lot of guys, Wills Potassio, Uncanny X-Men, uh um, Rob Liefeld, who I talk to periodically on, on Instagram. Uh, uh, X Force and Jim Lee took over X Men, and eventually, when that ran dry, he ends up in DC, and it, he he does the new Fifty Two. <laughs> and I said, "Oh shoot, man, that's like a kick in the nuts to Marvel." Yep. It, it was just, it was, but it's great, man, because I I love watching. I like the art, you know. I know there's 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 business behind it. But I'm just a fan of it. I just want to see what they put out next. Yeah. And like I said, Kirby was something else, man. He, he his, his Fantastic Four, 
Oh. Uh, his old Avengers and Incredible Hulk and stuff. He His characters had a s- certain distinctive look, almost like a chiseled look. Yeah. And man, he could draw beautiful women, couldn't he? Yeah. Jack Kirby, his women were like, man, like the they way they posed. Off the- they, they yeah. Had a lot of feminine poses, but they were superheroes. Right. Absolutely, yeah. man. Yeah. So, you know, it, it was great to see that. Um, when I was kind of like, you know, getting ready to head to my freshman year of high school, I had a uh, a series of Captain America issues that I loved, and John Byrne was drawing them. One of my favorites, then. dude. One of my the way favorites. John Byrne drew Captain America. He was on that for I don't know how long, but I bought almost every issue that he drew because I loved how he did Cap. But he, when he left, there was another artist, and his name forgets me. Uh, I, I, I can't remember the guy right now, but he was trying to draw Cap like John Byrne, but it John wasn't Byrne. the same. <laughs> John Byrne's artwork was so clean. John Byrne, you know what you do? In my opinion, his best work was, was when he was drawing the Fantastic Four. I don't remember how many issues he did, but... He was one of the first artists, my and it's at my brother's house. Um, the the book was in 1984. Um, when Terax the Tamer came from space, he's a herald of Galactus, and he came down, and the thing is sitting in the back of a New York City taxi cab, and the shit splits in half, and Terax is there with his axe, and Ben Grimm was like, "For what? What are you doing?" And they start fighting. And Terax is a dog. And he's kicking Ben's ass, and Ben's fighting the best way he can. The rest of the Fantastic Four show up. He's kicking their ass. Silver Surfer shows up. And man, you know what was unique about that book? John Byrne was one of the first artists that he made you appreciate destruction. Yeah, the way yeah, you, the way yeah. you drew a building falling. And I remember <laughs> Ben Grimm threw a punch and knocked the house over, and Tevax <laughs> grabbed him by the back and threw him, and shit was falling. Half of the comic was shit d- getting destroyed. I'm like, oh, 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 man! And that I was, was and, and he did that so well. And Silver Surfer, that was a comic he actually killed his ass. Silver Surfer grabbed him and overloaded and fried him out, and he killed him. And he did it by accident. But I said, man, that book, it's at my brother's house. The original yeah. copy, it's at my brother's house, man. And John Byrne, he drew Submariner so well. He drew the, he drew the X-Men they showed up. He used to draw the Incredible Hulk. Man, John Byrne is that dude, man. I loved his artwork, man. I yeah. loved him, man. Matter of fact, I didn't like, Kirby's Captain America. I for whatever reason I didn't like that, right? But when John Byrne jumped on it, I was on every issue, man. I'm telling you, that was as it was something about the way he drew the uh roundness of his shield and stuff like that. And it was like the chain mail on his uh on his uh costume, all of that, man. And he only made the three stripes on his on his uh you know waist you know, that goes around like a flag there. But Byrne was awesome, man. Man, he was awesome with what he would do, man. That that was just, whew. That era, Drew, people don't realize, do they? They, they don't realize. They don't, they don't know. They don't know. They don't, they'll never know. And if you love the artwork, man, this is why we geeking out over it, man, because that's, that's my era. 80s and the 90s was really good, too. Yes, the '90s was really, really good, really, really good, man. And I'm a I, that same day I met uh, uh, Jim Lee. I also met Todd McFarlane, and that guy, man, that guy is something else. I he signed my first issue of Spawn. I airlocked wow. it. I have it signed. He signed it. I had to make a decision because I had a Spawn. Sure, well, I got your text, brother. Yeah. I got your spawn. I got the spawn number one, and I had a, a toy of a, a, a Jason Wynn from the comic book. I had the toy. I have it unopened. 
and you can't find it nowhere. And you know when I found it, I found it at an old store in Yonkers called it used to be there called Dragon's Den. It was a comic book and model store. And they used to have a big old tub. And I used to just go in there. I, I, I collected action figures at one point. And I went in there and I yanked one out. I said, this is Jason Wynn. And I didn't tell the fool because the, the girl would mark the stuff down and throw it in the bucket. Yeah, and yeah. She only they, she only had one. And I didn't tell her that that was a hot item. I don't even know how it got there. But I said, yo, this five dollars? She said, yeah. Bring it up, bring it up, quick. Pay five dollars for it. I took that to the comic book convention. You know how many people ran up to me and said, yo, where'd you get that? Chill. I will bust your ass. Don't come near me. <laughs> and then they said, they said, Todd McFarlane's downstairs. So I had Spawn One and I had the Jason Wing. And I said, I got to go with the with the Spawn One. And um, I, you had to pay to go see him. Right. And um, two things happened. I'm waiting at the door and I'm like, yo, I could just walk in and who the, who the fuck's going to stop me? But I said, I don't want to do that. A, a woman was there with her boyfriend and she was like in, uninterested in everything. She says, listen, my boyfriend dragged me here. I don't want to be here and I have this ticket. Do you want it? A little white chick. And I'm like, are you serious? She said, yeah, I don't want to be here. Here, just, just, I'm going to go sit down. I see you walking around and I said, thanks. I went in, I took a picture with him and I said, ah, and he said, the Jason Wynn is a, is a collector's item, it looks like. But he said, you know what? You might want to get that one signed. So he signed my spawn number one. But I still have that Jason Wynn, though. But, um, That's awesome stuff. Yeah, man. man Todd McFarlane yeah. is a trendsetter. Until we sat here this evening having this conversation, I didn't know that we shared that in common as well as far as going to the conventions and stuff because mm -hmm. that's a, that that lets you know who we are bro that is yeah that man right there in a nutshell yeah, oh man okay yeah i got that drew mm -hmm. salute to i am trill will tay tay mma combat and entertainment uh con Shonery, eric o geo james macadus mac uh, William Old School, Jason, uh, Shauna TV. Uh, salute to all of you out there uh, coming in after we did a roll call. Yave, I see you out there. Uh, Drew, let's get on to the other meat of the show that we wanted to talk about and the play on the words of the, ten of the title of tonight's show, Multiverse of Nerdism. When we talk about the multiverse, in the comics uh would you like to share with our our listeners like what that really means when it comes down to when you talk about the multiverse uh you know and 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 we, we're going to get into uh what's happening as of late and everything with the movies the tv series and stuff like that but we kind of want to give them an idea because some of them may not be as versed as we are <laughs> yeah right right <laughs> <laughs> so um, okay, multi multiverse. Um, pretty much what we've been talking about. Multiverse pretty much means that there's endless possibilities. And me and Stormy talked about this behind the scenes. Now, y'all know the Doctor Strange thing is in the theaters now. And it's endless possibilities. Endless, endless possibilities. There's there's not just one Loki. See, as soon as I said it, he put the picture up. <laughs> there's, see, me in sync, bro. There's not one Loki. How did you do that, man? That's crazy. There's not just one Loki. There's endless possibilities of different Lokis. There's a goddamn Loki alligator. There's a kid Loki. There's an old Loki. There's a female Loki. But 616 is the main universe, right? Now, um... Just to jump ahead, I want y'all to understand because I also saw uh who put that in there. Okay, all right, all right. I want y'all to check, I want y'all to pay attention, y'all. Endless possibilities. So, right now, in my opinion, Marvel's killing it. Yes, Marvel's sir. killing it. All right. We, we're in we're now in phase four. I don't even have no idea what phase five is, but I want you guys to um just just fancy this. When everything comes, because now they introduced the mutants. We saw Professor X, 
spoiler alert, we saw Professor X. So now um, there's no holds barred. We're going to see an uh, X-Men pop up. We don't know if it's going to be the original cast or a new cast, but we're going to see a Wolverine. We're seeing a female Thor. We're going to see uh, a new Cyclops. We're going to see a Colossus. We're going to see all of that. We're going to see a Deadpool. We're going to see all of it, right? But when they bring things full circle, imagine this, y'all. Once everything is in order, or order to the best way that they know, know how, that one last universe that needs to be closed. Imagine the Avengers walking through that universe. And they're looking around like, this doesn't look like our universe at all. It don't smell right. It don't look right. The people don't look right. It's us, but it's not us. What's going on? And they see another group and they turn around and it's the goddamn Justice League. Crossover. Yep. That is possible. When they start playing with multiverses and stuff, and understand, DC is along those exact same lines. The exact same lines lines they do they deal with uh, infinity crisis crisis on infinite earths they do the same thing over there different characters and i'm gonna tell you something else i remember i seen in the comics a few years ago a few years ago uh i, I vaguely remember this they traveled to the end of time i forgot which characters did it and they ran into an angel and when the angel turned around, it was a goddamn angel from Image Comics, from Spawn. And this was DC characters. Now, I want you guys to recognize something also. There was a, 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 a cartoon film. Uh, uh, it was the Flash, Flashpoint. Flashpoint. If you watch Flashpoint, when Flash went into that other Earth where, uh, um, what was it? Aquaman had an affair with Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman killed his wife. And Atlantis started beefing with uh, uh, the Amazons. Right? There were image comic characters in that dimension. Mm -hmm. Okay? And people won't even pick that up. I said, what is Grifter doing in this? He's an image character. You see what I'm saying? The possibilities yeah. are endless. Let, let me hang something this. on... Let me hang something on what you just said, too, with DC and Marvel about a future possible crossover. James Gunn, when he got fired from Marvel a couple of years back, DC hired him to do the new Suicide Squad film. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, Kevin Feige fought to have James Gunn reinstated with Marvel so he could finish out what he was doing with them. Not just the Guardians of the Galaxy 3 that's on the horizon, but some of the uh, galactic stories that they were going to be telling, like with the Marvels and stuff like that. He had already planted seeds right. through what they were going to be doing. But Mr. Gunn let the cat out of the bag that he had a conversation with some DC people and Kevin Feige, that somewhere down the line that they discussed the possibilities of having that crossover that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. But it'll be after they finish telling some of these other stories that they have on the table. And they have a vast amount of them. So even whoever's around right now might be the might not be those playing those characters when that final crossover. But you can't tell me that nobody will spend the money to go see it. And you're oh, talking man. about possibly $2 billion <laughs> right then if they were to cross over Marvel and DC. That right there would be one of the greatest things in the history of cinema right there. Man, all kinds of fans will be coming. I, I won't be surprised. I don't want to wish this. I say it jokingly, but in this day and age, you never know. It might be a goddamn gang war of old people. The Hulk's better than Superman. No, Thor's better than everybody. You know, it's going, you know, it'll be all in good fun, man. But that'll be the most nerdiest get together, like, of all times. I left this picture of Loki up for a reason. 
just to get quickly through this, if you guys haven't had a chance to see the Loki Disney Plus series, please check it out. Because if you're following the Marvel films, this film, this uh, mini series right here with Loki, which has been greenlit for a second season, they're going to have a second season of Loki on Disney Plus. But this series right here is so integral to what is happening right now and how the world is in, in uh, the Marvel Universe is changing with every film. It, it's, it cannot be overstated. So bringing us to up to speed to Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, which is out right now. I had a chance to see it. Drew had a chance to see it. It's a tremendous story within the multiverse of things, happenings. Uh, following on the heels of Spider-Man, uh, what what's, what is it? Uh, far, I'm trying uh, to get Far From Home. Uh, far From Home. No, the, uh, the latest one. Oh, the late. Oh, oh, oh. oh it's no Way Home. No Way Home, yeah. Because, you know, those play on homes, it's like now, nah, yeah, it's yeah, all yeah, in yeah, my yeah. head now. It's like, wow. Spider-Man, No Way Home. Doctor Strange is in that film. And there's a serious storyline that connects this to the Loki TV series. This film here, Multiverse of Madness. Uh, so much going on that it is, you, you, you have to see the films, but you do have to watch Loki. Because Loki sets all of this up and it puts a character who is going to be tremendously meaningful in the near future. Kang the Conqueror is in this. If you've read the comics, you're familiar with Kang. They found a way to put that in there. But with this particular film, uh, Multiverse of Madness, we actually see the Scarlet Witch come into her own. And even off of her TV series that was you know, uh, what was it called, Drew? The um, the Disney Wanda Plus Vision. series? Wanda huh? Vision. Wanda, Wanda Vision. Vision, yeah. Where we saw her coming around to being in her. This film right here shows Scarlet Witch, she could have handled Thanos all by herself, people. Yeah. She could have handled Thanos all by herself and was going to until Thanos told his people to rain fire down on everybody. Otherwise... He was going to die at the hands of Scarlet Witch. And she is incredibly powerful. And she has an agenda in this film. You guys have got to check it out. But with the multiverse, what we're finding is there are characters from alternative universes who show up and they begin to have an impact. America Chavez, whose superpower is traveling through alternate universes. And she's the only one of her kind. When I say the only one, you know how we just said there's different yous in all these universes. She's the only one. Yes. And th this is so amazing to uh, see how this story plays out. And of course, we get the money of... <laughs> This right here, man, I had to bring it in there, Drew, because man. it just gives people a reason to buy into it. Now, what you see right there is John Krasinski as Reed Richards, Mr. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. And then you see, uh, uh, what's her name? That's not Monica Rambeau. Monica Rambeau is the daughter, but right. that's her. To his to his right immediately, that's Rambo's mom, Carol Danvers' best friend, as a alternate universe's Captain Marvel. Then Very just to his, just to his left, who is that? Drew, tell Black everybody Bolt. who that is. Black Bolt from the Inhumans. From the Inhumans, and it's the same actor who played him. In the Inhumans in the, in television, the series. television series, yeah. And off to the far left, you got Peggy Carter, mm -hmm. aka Captain Britain, Captain Britain, 
from the What If series in live action. What If is on the Disney Plus channel. It's an animated series by Marvel, all included in the 616 universe of storytelling. And there you have Peggy Carter, a.k.a. Captain Britain. Dude, when they when they brought this out for the people, you could just hear gasps in the audience when I was watching this, Drew. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what it was like for your, your viewing experience, but it was really a, a geek out moment for for the film. My my uh my heart was racing. <laughs> and then when Professor X rolled out, and then you heard the 1990s theme from the cartoon. Uh -huh. I said, hell no. <laughs> they really they went there. They're doing they're everything, they're doing everything great. Da -da 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 -da. And I said, oh shit. <laughs> Here we go. If um, and I know this is a shot in the dark, but please, and y'all know who I'm talking to. <sighs> Listen, man. If you're seeing this, please come back and play Wolverine for at least two movies. Just do it for us, man. We know there could be any other Wolverine or whatever. Just come back, Hugh Jackman. Please. Just 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 humor us, please. Just do it. Just do it. Please. Damn. Yeah, man. This this, this right here, this film is so important. But they have been laying the groundwork for what's to come. Now, is Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness a great film? I don't think so. But it's a very good film. And what is happening is these films should no longer be looked at as whether they're great, they're good, or whatever. It's just like an issue of a comic book now. Do you know, like, Last issue might have held you on pins and needles to see what would happen in the next issue. And when you get the next issue, the story might slow down a little bit. They may bring in some new plot lines. Mm -hmm. And when you thought something was going to go balls to hell, it's just, you know, again, they, they stringing you along. That's how these films are now. If you didn't see Sp Spider-Man No Way Home, you won't really get the feel for what's happening here in Multiverse of Madness. If you didn't see the Loki series, you wouldn't know what's really happening with the Spider-Man No Way Home. All of this stuff is really connected. But they stand alone. But when you read it collectively, it's like, wow, this is amazing storytelling here. Drew, were you able to see the Eternals? Yes. Okay, did you stay for the end credits? Yes. Do you know who that voice was? Yes. <laughs> and we ain't even seen him yet. But that voice talking to my man about when he opened that box with the sword. You sure oh, you're ready man. for that? Man. Man, listen. Listen. What's dope is this can go in so many different directions. And once again, Kang the Conqueror is going to be such a big villain that once they reveal everyone, right, they're going to have that one thing in common. Like, you know what? What's the root of this evil? This King the Conqueror dude. Shout out to them making him black, by the way. <laughs> that guy is a problem. So we got to join forces and get rid of him. And Kang, that man ain't got no goddamn friends. So you're going to see probably villains team up with heroes and try and get busy. If y'all don't know, Kang is dangerous, man. That guy's dangerous. And we still haven't seen a good Dr. Doom, who's also a problem. Dr. Doom is a problem. He's a he's an intellectual narcissistic. He's a, he's a problem, man. He is a problem. Whenever you see these comics where it's a post-apocalyptic and all the heroes is dead, well, Dr. Doom is always still around somehow. Dr. Doom <laughs> yep. and Banner. Dr. Doom, Banner, and Logan. They're always around. And it's like, how the fuck Dr. Doom's still alive? He always makes it. He's always around. It's crazy. And, and, and let me drop this on the people if they haven't, if, if they didn't know this. 
There is a film coming. All right. There's a film coming. They haven't said when they're releasing it, but it is on the pipeline. World War Hulk. Bro. It's coming. Now, I can only imagine what that's going to be. They they danced around it in the second Thor movie. Right. They dan- they took bits and pieces of it. But if y'all haven't read World War Hulk, you see why they banished him in the first goddamn place. Okay? And that World War Hulk, you're going to look at that and be like, yo, if he got that mad, he'd have killed Thanos on that ship. World War Hulk is so strong that he could stomp the ground and split a planet in half. And guess what? That's not even the strongest Hulk. World Breaker Hulk is not the strongest Hulk. There's a new one called Titan Hulk. He upped the levels. His strength level is like godlike now. It's it's crazy what they're doing with that character. But if they do a World War Hulk, because now they introduced the Illuminati, and those are the guys that banished him in the first place. So, so the Hulk now, that we see, the Hulk that we see that becomes World War Hulk, he might not even be the 616. Hulk. He might not. He might be a Hulk from a different universe. You know what I mean? Bro. And that endless that that whole thing, it, the, the possibilities are endless, man. And I wanted to let everybody know that they did release the full trailer for Thor, Love and Thunder today. So you can go online and Google it if you haven't seen it yet. The new trailer for Thor, Love and Thunder is out now. Um, mm-hmm. There's also something else to to be acknowledged about these films with Marvel and what they're doing. Uh, We've got Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumanium coming. That might be your introduction to the Fantastic Four right there. I like, tell them why, tell them why. Yeah, because Hank Pym and his wife you know, they worked for S.H.I.E.L.D. when they were young. And Peggy knew these guys, right? And you saw a little bit of it, a small telling of a story where they had to disarm a, a missile during the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, what happened is, you know, Hank's wife, she shrunk down and that's how she got uh, stuck in the, the quantum realm. And Hank couldn't do it. Uh, But allegedly, in the uh, Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness, as I showed you a little while ago, Doctor Strange comes across Reed Richards. And he makes, he has this one line of dialogue where he asks Reed about him and his family being somewhere around in the 60s. And uh, Reed acknowledged it. But it wasn't that Reed, but he still acknowledged the experience of what Dr. Strange, Stephen Strange was saying. So they've already dropped the line, just like they dropped Stephen Strange's name in The Winter Soldier. They sure did. Bruce Banner, Stephen Strange. On the rooftop, when they were dealing with, what's my man's name? The bald head dude? Bald headed dude, yeah. Yeah. He said, yo, yo, yo. what'd he say? That, that high security? Bruce the high Banner, security Stephen going Strange. after all possible threats. You know, uh, he, he said, uh, Bruce Banner, Banner Stephen, Stephen Strange, Strange, all these guys. He, he yeah. dropped names. And it's and like, we haven't even called Dr. Strange yet, you know? That's right. That's so right. that's how Marvel does it, man. If you're not paying attention, they, they are constantly slipping stuff in. And they yeah. say that there are so many Easter eggs in this particular film, Multiverse of Madness, that you actually have to watch this movie several times to go back and see what they're doing in there. You know, I can't wait till it comes out on video because that this is the kind of movie I like to sit down and just watch it, pause it, you know, take a minute go back you know you can't do that in the theater you know but it's like man you know but i am so 
geeked out for this, man. And I tell you, the more that we're seeing this stuff, the more it, you, you would think that D.C. would get it together. But you know what I what I don't like about D.C., Drew, is the fact that cinematically their TV shows were great. Yeah. But cinematically. If it doesn't do box office revenue that they projected to make, they abandon the idea of continuing on. And then they'll just say, let's go make another Batman movie with yeah. another Batman. You know what I'm saying? It's like yeah. they continue to do this stuff so foolishly. If you look in the past 10 years, how many Batman films we had or how oh, many shit. guys have played Batman cinematically for DC? It's ridiculous. There's been about 12 Batman films. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And, and, and you could actually, where's the, where's the Man of Steel 2? You finally got a a a a, 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 a solid guy to play him. that yeah. the audiences love him yeah. and Camille, and they won't make another film. It's ridiculous. The, the, the director Zack Snyder finally got a guy who had a vision for mm -hmm. films. He had a five film vision. He had a a Man of Steel film, a, a Man of Steel sequel, uh, and three Justice League films that would culminate in Superman turning into the goody two-shoes guys that we all know him to be. But there was supposed to be a, a, a arc in his story that they go through. The, the people at DC Warner Brothers was like, ah, oh, nobody wants to see that. Do you know the black suit Superman that shows up in the Justice League film, the real Justice League film? It's like he didn't want, they didn't want to do that. You know what I mean? They 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 didn't want to keep the reality. They wouldn't let him wear the mullet because he was supposed to wear the mullet too. But they said, no, 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 don't put a mullet on Henry Cavill. It's like they they totally and see that's why they're losing on their, their films. films. Their films seem rushed. Um, you can't play catch up to Marvel because obviously that's the competition. But you see, you have to get the audience to fall in love with the characters. There has to be some sort of, um, you have to like the character to appreciate it. You have to want to see more of the character. Um, the Aquaman movie, see, look, this is my childhood. So it's fun to look at. What they do with these special effects are amazing. But you got to still fall in love with the character to want to see it again. You know, and it's like you're being force fed. You know there's going to be a sequel. You know you're going to see it again, but do you really care about it? You understand? And that that Superman movie when he fought Zod and everything, that was a damn good film. I mean, that was a it was I it got a little I got a little dizzy looking at it in the theater because there was so much going on, but that was a damn good film. The Batman versus Superman was a damn good film. And they took pieces from the comic book, you know, um the Dark Knight Returns and stuff like that. Damn good film. But they dropped the ball a little bit. Um the Justice League was rushed. It's like I see it coming, but there's no anticipation. See, with Marvel, there was legitimately, you go back and look at when Marvel Phase 1 started, there was a building point, a building point. We're doing Iron Man 1, 2. Then we're going to bring in Captain America. We're going to do an Incredible Hulk. And then 1, 2, 3. And, and then those, those, and then at the end of the, uh, what was it? At the end of, what is it? Iron Man, was it 2? Um, they get shield gets a call to say, Yo, we're down here by the site now. And then you go, they 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 turn the camera and it's Thor's hammer. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh shit, they're doing Thor, you know. Yep. And it was a build-up, a build-up, a build-up. Then we had three Thor movies. No, two, two so far. And now we're going on the third one. You understand? And it was a build-up. So now you have, dare I say, a romance with all of the characters because outside of the Avengers, they have different stories. And you're anticipating what's next. I don't get that with DC. I don't get what's next with DC. It's just that they're there and they're playing keep up. Marvel puts out a movie, we're going to put out a movie. You know, and now, and you see, even right now with this, with the Black Panther 2, they, in every film, they introduce something new. I'm waiting to see Prince Namor. I'm waiting for that. You understand? Because I know what's coming. But it's like, what, how are they going to do it? What are they going to do? What are they going to do? How are they going to do it? With DC, it's like, okay, they're going to tell you what they're going to do. And they're going to tell you what they're going to do next. It's like, 
there's no love there. They're playing catch up. And I think a crossover Marvel DC down the road will save them. And it'll be in their best interest to, because it'll be in their best interest to work together because it won't last forever. Everybody will go off to their own universe and do their own goddamn thing. Marvel is, is in such a great position now where um, the other two Spider-Men can have their own movies and people will give a shit. You know, what, what, what those Peters are doing now. They can have one more movie apiece now. And we'll run and go see it. Like, what's going on? What's going on with him now? What happened between uh, uh, No Way Home and after his second movie? And, you know, what happened to Peter Parker's Venom in, that, in, in his universe? The other one. You know, I mean, come on, man. Tobey Maguire's Peter Parker. You understand? I want to know what happens. I mean, this is yeah. just great stuff. Yeah. And like I said, one of the things that uh, they keep doing is making Batman films. It's mm -hmm. like, I wish they would just put put Batman on ice for a moment. Yeah. Huh? I just wish they put him on ice because it's just like the Green Lantern film that they made with Ryan Reynolds. Now, Ryan Reynolds was a, a great Hal Jordan. You know, yeah. that was great. And kind of kind of puts you in mind of Tony Stark's Iron Man with his humor and his aloofness that even under the most dire circumstances he's joking around and stuff is like but the first film it was the first film but they left you with a cliffhanger that had audiences couldn't wait to see what was going to happen next because sinestro sinestro had developed the yellow ring, yellow ring. yeah and they just left that just left it seriously these people don't have no clue, man. They don't have a clue. So it's like, you just don't know what you're going to get, you know, from them. And then they went into the Suicide Squad because they were trying to mimic Guardians of the Galaxy and stuff like that. You know, this Birds of Prey that nobody really wanted to see when, when they did that kind of foolishness. Mm -hmm. huh wonder woman was great but they interfered with the second film and patty jenkins her vision of wonder woman what she wanted to do it just it totally got ruined by them they do you know drew and i don't know audience if you're listening to this when the first wonder woman film there was a great scene in that film called no man's land where she she went across the field in the in the war to open things up so that they their their men that was pent down during world war one could get across to try to save that village of people and everything and reclaim it in that film was when it showed wonder woman doing her thing and she was like fighting the soldiers and she led the way the, the producers wanted her to cut that scene out the film. Why? They wanted Patty Jenkins to cut that scene out of the film. She was like, this is the freaking heart of the movie. What are you talking about? This is the scene where Wonder Woman steps out and no man in the film says, can you believe this woman doing this? What they did was like, hey, she's taking on the fire. Let's go. And it's like it took the it took the honest of her being a woman off of things and made you see the heroism you see what i'm saying and of course we could see it's a woman mm -hmm. but you don't have to bang us over the head and say woman 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 that's what was so great about that film but in the second film they just totally went back to objectifying women and making it something you know and it's like it failed these people really need to learn something, bro. They need to learn. And right now they're making bad, bad films because they only are looking at the box office. They only looking at trying to make money. And that's the mistake that Sony was making, you know, after a couple of Spider-Man films and stuff like that in both franchises, mm -hmm. the X-Men films, you guys are just shooting for, the bag. It's like, give the people some characters to care about. The reason that Hugh Jackman Wolverine is so successful 
is because one, he's a he's a pretty darn good actor. He has charisma, mm -hmm. but they took a little bit more time with Wolverine yeah. to tell his story more than anyone else. But Cyclops got a damn great story. Gene Gray got a damn great story. And they didn't take the time with those characters. Nope. Marvel doubled back and made a Black Widow film and totally changed the way you look at Black Widow. Yeah. There's a few changes in that film I didn't appreciate, but whatever. But I, I get what you're saying. It made, made people put like this. You know what the difference is with Marvel movies? You could be unfamiliar with everything on that screen, but you will leave that theater thoroughly satisfied. And knowing by the time it's over, you know about that character. And yes. that's all of them. You know, yes. um, the only thing with um, the Black Widow movie, although it was a great film, there, there was there was great parts in that film. I don't like what they did with the goddamn Taskmaster. I don't appreciate I know. that at all. I know. Don't appreciate that. At I know. All. They didn't have to do that. That little part, they didn't have to do that. The Taskmaster was not a mother effing woman in the book. No way. All right. They did not have to stop. Kick and I, okay. I want to. I know. Sure. I know. I know what you're saying. Yeah. I know what you're saying. Yeah. But yeah, that's, you know what? And, and you're right. You're right. Because when I spoke of the film, I wasn't speaking of that you know, particular yeah. character or whatever, but I'm talking about, you know, Scarlett Johansson, she should have had a Black Black Widow film way before, but I'm I'm glad she got her film, you yeah. know? And uh, she'll always be badass to me. And let's face it, man, she sacrificed herself. You know, she took but the biggest hit for the team. You know what's dope? In that alternate universe where Strange got killed by Black Bolt, and they killed Thanos, I don't think he assembled the damn gauntlet there, so Black Widow might be alive in that timeline. That's right, and they she can, can bring back. her back. Yep. But I'll tell you, man, this, isn't it... And, and speaking of just... Let, let's talk about Thanos for one moment. When... When he threw Gamora over that mountain, man. Dude, I had I that hit me in the feels, bro. <laughs> Yo, you that know hit what I me said? in the feels. Because yeah. it's it's like he always talked about how he loved her. Mm -hmm. So you knew his purpose was tremendously focused for him to do what he did it's like that's the ultimate villain right there man he threw his daughter off a damn cliff y'all in the name of the universe now when you really think about it it is so <laughs> Thanos is so goddamn petty and let me give y'all something else if you don't know about Thanos in the book, he's a bigger a-hole in the book. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> he's a bigger a-hole in the book. He's a big time a-hole. There was something he did in this storyline. When I got done reading it, I, I was sitting here at my desk like, who the hell wrote this? Why did he do that? <laughs> Y'all want, I'll give you the short version of this comic. This girl, I think she was blind and she had this beautiful life. She met a guy and something. It was like a, I'm reading it. It was a corny story or whatever. And then I think, I think she like blinked and in a snap, she lost everything. And she was like, what the hell happened? And Thanos is at the back of the comic book, just standing with his arms behind his back with that fucking smile he got. You know what this dumbass did? He went back to a moment in time and just changed her past slightly so that she never missed her. She never met her husband. She didn't have a job. She ended up on like welfare or something. Her whole life was altered because he altered her direction at that one moment. And I think she ended up being becoming blind. 
It's like one little thing he changed, her life went from perfect to complete crap. And I'm reading this like, what am I reading? And at the end, I turn the page, he's just standing behind her with his hands behind him, smiling. He did it for no reason. <laughs> and I said, yo, why are you, why is he effing with people? The writer wrote that, but that's who Thanos is. He's an he's an a-hole. So of course he threw Gamora off the damn cliff. <laughs> this guy's a jerk. He's, he's a jerk. Really think when about he what he did. When he was talking to her on that mountain and she started talking stuff to him and everything. And when uh Red Skull said to her, what, what he what did he say? I don't remember the line of dialogue. Sacrifice he was like, something you love. Or something yeah, like sacrifice. That. He's not talking about himself. And she looked at him and it's, all of a sudden she yep. got it. She and said, he was oh, like right shit. up. He was like right up on her too. And yep. you know what, Drew? They had the nerve to have a tear rolling down his eye. <laughs> you know what? That was great acting because at that moment, Gamora didn't know she was going over. She was like, he don't love nobody. What is he doing here? He had to sacrifice something he loved. And Red Skull said that shit to her. She looked at him, turned around, and he's crying. She said, yeah. and, it, and it registered, oh, shit. <laughs> he loves me, but he's about to throw me off this damn cliff. Yep. And he got that damn soul stone. But, dude, he grabbed her by the wrist and drug her. She was, like, trying to pull back and everything, and he just went. Like nothing. Like he was tossing a softball to the catcher behind home plate. Man. Dude, I was sitting there. I was like, I was in the theater like this, Drew. I was like. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, shit, he did that? I thought he was going to find a way to, 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 you know, con the Red Skull out of the Soul Stone. When he grabbed her and threw her ass, I said, yo, she's dead. Now, understand, family. And see, this is what I, this is what I was telling people. That hit see, me my in the dad, feels, man. I was like, man. My my dad watches it, but he fell off right when, you know, I think in the 80s where it started to take a turn. So I had to explain to him. So, you know, at the end of the uh, first Avengers film, and you see Thanos smiling, my father says, well, who's that? I said, dad, that is like the worst villain in the world. <laughs> and he said, well, what does he do? I said, just know this. If they're going where I think they're going to go, he wins. He said, what do you mean? I said, he wins. People die, and he won. He, in the comic book, it was worse. Yeah. When he did the snap in the comic, Spider-Man just said people just started disappearing. How they did it in the movie was kind of like grimy. People just start disintegrating. Yeah. And um, in the comic, he also has this weird obsession with death. And yes. death, Lady death, death is a woman. Yeah. <laughs> she would be a woman. <laughs> <laughs> And he kisses on everything. And he won. He had to bring the universe back. He won. Thanos won. In the, in the movie, they, you know, when they did the time jump and he saw himself, he said, I won. I won, you know, but that Thanos got it wrong because he let his guard down. He was weak, but I'm going to get it right. Imagine you thinking you killed Thanos. You, you aim for the head. You cut his head off. And then you see him coming back. You're like, oh, for God's <laughs> sake, man. Damn. Who did this? Right? Damn. Man, Thanos is a badass. Man. But I'm going to tell you guys something else, though. You know who's worse than him other than Kang? Because Kang is worse, y'all. Y'all going to see. Kang is worse. But Dark Side is that dude. I can't wait to see those Omega Beams. Somebody going to catch it. Somebody gonna catch it, and DC gotta get it right. DC well, gotta get it you, right. Did you did you see the Snyder cut of Justice yes. League? Oh yeah, 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 dude. They got it he, right. No, no, I'm saying that part two was supposed to have Dark Side come back, you know, because that portal closed up when he kicked old boy when they kicked old boy's head in there. Yeah. And he crushed Steppenwolf. it. Steppenwolf, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, Darkseid was just looking at him. 
But you know Zack Snyder had something up his sleeve for Darkseid. Because we didn't get a chance to see Darkseid go to work yet. Yo, listen. Darkseid is an mf -er. Dark side is, and DC has so many good storylines and so many great characters. And I love the way he looked, by the way, too. Yeah, uh, they, they 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 nailed it. They nailed it with him. Zack Snyder's Steppenwolf and Dark Side looked awesome. Yeah, the and what's her name? Came, the the one Graham. that came out in in the first uh, Justice League film that that uh, mm -hmm. what's his name that did the first Avengers film? It, mm -hmm. That that's not the yeah, real Dark that. Side and Steppenwolf. And did did you see what's her name? What, what was what's her name? The mother, or they call her grandma? What's her name? Uh, she was standing uh, there. She had no lines, but she was standing there. Oh, the uh, the older lady. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. I can't think of her name can't right think now. Of her name, but she's a badass herself. Mm -hmm. But they 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 can nail Dark Side. He is a problem. He can go one D with Superman for real. And yeah. um, I don't like how they downplay Doomsday. You bring him up in one movie. Y'all will never know. Well, of course, y'all will understand how big of a problem Doomsday was because he killed Superman. But yeah, and then they made him like he was really a clone of Zod. You know, yeah, it's that's like stupid. You know, that's that, stupid, man. That was kind of rushed, you know. Very rushed. I appreciate the special effects, but it was all rushed. All rushed, man. DC has some great characters, great storylines. They need to take their time. Make out a nice, nice. I mean, right now, I say this Marvel uh, from phase one till now, we're going off, we're going over 10 years now, just like that. Just like that, it's been 10 years. They had we, one character in that DC universe that they were doing that they were bringing along slowly, almost too slowly. And you know who that was? General Swanwick, who turned out to be Martian yeah. Manhunter. Martian Manhunter. Because, yeah. You know, again, but there were no hints that he was Martian Manhunter, but mm -hmm. they were slowly bringing him along. But see, the way that they did that, that's how you're supposed to stoke the flames for the universe that you're building. That's yeah, just like, I had no idea they were gonna make a Martian, but you know what? I should have known, because Martian Manhunter, his alter ego is a black man. Right. And I just didn't know think it would be him. Man of Steel, when they had him sitting in the in the, in the, uh, the interrogation room with Lois, and yeah. he had handcuffs on, right? Mm -hmm. And they they said that this was a key. When Kalel stood up from the from the uh, interrogation room's table and walked toward the glass where Swanwick was standing there, and the scientist guy was standing next to him, and a couple of military people were standing next to Swan Swanwick. When when Kalel stood up and he did his hands like this and the handcuffs broke off and he walked to the glass, everybody else moved back. Swanwick was still standing right there at the glass. He never yeah. moved. Yeah. Yeah. He never moved. You know who I'd like to see? I should have known then. Cause because he, he could he could fuck with Superman. But you know who else I want to see? They're doing us military. What's his name? It's Captain Adam. Oh. Yeah, Captain Adam. That that has to come. He's another guy that's very powerful, you know. But that that has to come. But DC has all the tools, all the storyline. They just need to take their time, and they could. They're behind right now. They've had five years to catch up. They just rushed everything because this is just, this is all business to them. They're like, okay, we got like a forty million dollar budget or whatever it is. We're gonna make our money back because everyone everyone loves Aquaman and Superman and Wonder Woman, but. How about showing your uh, supporters some respect and giving us a good storyline and, and make us want to come back and see what's happening? Yeah, absolutely. I'd appreciate that. So, yeah, we we went a little over our time, but if you've got some final thoughts or something you want to give for, you know, the show or any other subject that we talked about this evening, you know, there's so much more we could say, you know, but it's like yeah. we only have so much time to work with. But I, I appreciate us being able to get this one out, you know. Yeah, I, I, I aspire to be the uh, scrapbook boxing of Noid's culture. <laughs> you know, um, you know, I, I don't know if I could be that great, you know, uh, but seriously. Um, this is a great show, you know, because. 
uh, the term culture. And if you look at the things we have on the screen, um, we're subject to talk about any and everything. And it's about having a good time. And um, a majority of you are, you know, from the boxing channels. But you got to understand that sometimes we need an effing break. And you know what? Um, Y'all ever been to a fight party? The reason why fight parties are, are can be epic is because you, you you connect with people that you're cool with. You might make some new friends, hopefully no enemies or whatever. And um, before the fight, you're socializing. The fight comes on, it's over. You're still socializing. You understand? And when you're socializing, what are y'all talking about? The latest thing, the latest clothing, the latest uh, fashion, you know, the latest uh, movie. And um, you hang around people of like mind. You understand? Um, you might not get along with a casual fan at a fight party, but you might un he might like the same movies you like. So these, these conversations must be had. And um, that's why I appreciate things like this, you know, and we, we need a break because boxing pisses me off, you know, and um, although I, I'll be talking about it tomorrow because I'm pissed off, you know, but um, this is great. Um, I love comic books. I love movies. I, I love fashion. Um, you know, uh, we could we could get on here and talk about breaking next time. We don't know. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. We could talk yeah. about cu cultural dances. You know, classic example of that. If you're black and you don't know how to do electric slide, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with you. These are things you know. Electric slide and playing spades. As a black person, you need to know these things. That's just it. You know what I mean? So these things must be had. You don't know what we'll be talking about next, but comic books, artists, man, th this is my cup of tea. I, I legitimately... I love boxing, but I have fun doing this. Yes, sir. Boxing, I feel like I'm working when I'm talking boxing because I'm trying to right wrongs. I'm trying to reveal the truth. But here, I'm just, this is great. You remember this and you remember that? And what if they do that? And this is great. This, this is sitting on grandma porch on a, with a, on a 70 degree night, just drinking your favorite beverage and just shooting the shit. I love it, man. Thank you, Stormy. This is great. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. And for me, it's the same. You know, like I said, you and I, we talk behind the scenes, but it seems like we find out more about each other when we right. do these right. shows. Isn't that it's crazy? Like, I didn't know you were like, like, man, we so much in comic, man. Yeah. It's like, it's ridiculous, you know? Mm -hmm. But again, the whole point of that, Drew, and I think it's what also centered us and made us the men that we are because our life experience has taken us to a point of absorbing culture you know it gives you a different sense of a a, a, a foundation and how you go about your life and everything a man who reads a man who writes a man who draws a man who does music uh, all of these things can put you in a position to uh, you, 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 what's in you can be shared with the world. You know what I mean? And then if you, especially if you have family that says, oh, you drew that or you, you wrote that or you, you play that song. Let me hear some more. It, when you got loved ones who can help cultivate that, it means something. Um, you'll find that a lot of people who are living in a negative sense out here in life that haven't done anything creative or anything like that, they don't feel value in themselves. They don't feel like they have anything to offer. But also, some of them haven't tried to do anything. You'd be surprised. Someone may be able to dance well. Someone may be able to sing. Someone may be able to, again, like I said, play that instrument or have some type of talent that just needs a little bit of a push. You know, you don't, everybody don't have to run with a football or play with a basketball or mm -hmm. throw a baseball. Mm -hmm. There's so much more that life has to offer. 
I work with a colleague who his son is like, I think his son is like 12, 13 years old now, something like that. But when his son was like four years old, he was like, hey, man, what do you think? I want to put my son in something like, you know, Taekwondo or something to do something with him, you know, and show him how to play with other kids and be a part of something, a team or whatever. I told him, I said, that's excellent. I said, I would do that, you know, because, you know, my background and being a coach and trainer in the gym, I work with small kids. They start bringing them in seven years old, six years old in the gym to box and stuff like that. So, you know, doing those kind of things. Now his son is, like I said, now 13, 14 years old. He's one of the top soccer players in the nation because he put his son in soccer when he was very young and small, five years old or whatever. He didn't like it at first, but his dad said, oh, you need to do this or whatever. And when he put his mind into it and started liking it, he got better. And he got more athletic. He got, it's like he started advancing beyond his, his, you know, peers. And now he's got, teams professional teams soccer teams looking at his son already mm. there's an opportunity possibly for scholarships and things like that he's already done some traveling for soccer and you know how big soccer is very worldwide so he's done this and i remember when he asked me years ago and my endorsement was absolutely put your son in something because you never know what could come out of that. And now his son might one day retire his dad because he is so good at what he's doing. I mean, literally, Drew, he is good. His name is on a high list of young boys his age. He's he's head and shoulders above everyone he plays against. Mm. <laughs> wow. And that and and that's not, you know, nothing to sneeze at. Like I said, they've traveled throughout the country, you know, playing in tournaments and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. He has to sometimes take time off of work to take his son to some of these events. But it's paying off. And his son has gotten good. He's, he's good, literally. You know, it's an amazing thing. So I said all of that to say, like, when we talk about culture. This is what it's all about. This is what we have before our fingertips. You you see these young kids out here in the street and stuff carrying pistols on them and stuff and don't know how to dress and don't know how to carry themselves. It's like because nobody ever took time out with them. Nobody ever took time out. If you got a dad, your dad's going to show you some things because that's the first teacher to teach you how to be a man. Damn. And if he's not around, how can you really become a man? You know, the woman can't do it. We sure. talked about that. Yeah. Right? We talked about that. The woman can give you all the nurturing and love in the world. But the man has to show you how to be a man. And we're not saying that in a superficial way. We're talking about it like what we have. And I'm sure I grew up with mine. You grew up with yours. And that's the difference. And I'm not saying that for those who didn't have that, because sometimes there are things that happen. Dad can be taken away. Dad can pass away. There's a number of things that, but that's not what I'm talking about here. Because there are still ways that the community can assist if you allow it to do so. Uh, and that mentorship can come in many forms. It can come from many different directions. Mm -hmm. But you also have to be receptive to it. That's right. You know, so, you know, just want to say that, you know, that's what this show is all about. We will have more of them. There will probably be more topics that we revisit. But the whole thing of it is, is that at least we're doing it. Sure. And it's a great breakaway from boxing because we talk yeah. boxing all the time, yeah. you know. But it's nice to be able to do this. We had some people in here this evening that showed some support. I see the thumbs up on this show is like 50 something. 
that's pretty cool. It's good. We'll that's take good. it. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. Because a lot of the stuff we're talking about, people know about it. But it's like to be a part of that, hey, get on board. We got some good stuff happening out here on both of our channels with what we're doing and how we see the, the horizon, you know. So I appreciate you being here with me this evening. I appreciate everybody that was out there in the chat this evening. And we'll be back for another one of these soon. Yes, sir. So, but uh, for that, we're going to sign on off. Everybody enjoy the rest of your week. And we'll catch you guys on the next one. No, it's on culture. Peace to everybody. Shout out to the mighty LDBC. And we out.